How great is our God tonight. How great is our God tonight. The God that can heal you is in this place. The God that can baptize you with the Holy Ghost is in this place. The God that can deliver you is in this place right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's worship our great God. Let's worship our great God. Let's worship our great God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Hallelujah, Jesus. How great is our God. How great is our God. How great is our God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Anybody feel the presence of the Lord in this place? Amen. I feel God moving in this house. He's been here since the first song. Amen. God's just been moving. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Woo. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. What a wonderful presence of the Lord that's in this place. Amen. God, God is moving. God is certainly moving in this place. Amen. So honored to be here again tonight. And I want to get right into the word of the Lord tonight. Uh, to the book of Isaiah. If you want to join me in the word of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12 is where I begin reading tonight. Honored to be here, counted an honor and privilege to be able to stand behind this pulpit, give honor to Brother Whittington, appreciate his leadership, appreciate his pastorship of this church for so many years. And um, uh, I think him often when I try to pastor, I was like, uh, if I had it figured out like Brother Whittington, I'd be all right. But I'm, I'm still working on it, brother. I'm still, I'm still trying to get there, but uh, I appreciate his friendship and his love over the years and his encouragement and uh, just glad to be here with my family. Appreciate uh, all of the, uh, the Jaegers and the Camp Bells. They just, uh, uh, we will be, come October, Sister Amy and I will be married 15 years. Uh, we'll, we'll be married 15 years and, uh, and I... Um, Appreciate that. We've had a lot of ups and downs, and probably one of the uh, most exciting part of our ministry and marriage was uh, Sunday afternoon when Saturday night when I was at my computer and I was trying to get ready for Sunday service. Uh, Jonas comes up to me a little sheepishly, and he walks up to me, and Mommy said, uh, Jonas has got something to tell you. And he's like, Daddy, I want to be baptized tomorrow. And so Sunday I had the privilege of baptizing uh, my little six-year-old in Jesus' name. And... And I appreciate that. Amen. He told us when we got into the car and was heading down here, he said, he said, Daddy, I spoke in tongues. And I said, and I said, that's great. I said, I didn't see him speak in tongues, but I'm, I'm going to let him claim the Holy Ghost. And uh, you stick around, you stick around Apostolic Church. If you didn't speak in tongues that time, you will. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. Amen going to read to you uh, Isaiah's description of Satan when he fell, but I want to take this and, and give you what the Lord has laid on my heart for tonight. The Bible says this, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? I want you to notice that he concludes by saying that people are going to look on him, the enemy of our soul, and say, is this the one? This is what caused me to be lost. This is what caused me to lose out on God. And, and so what I want to talk to us about for just a little while, I want to preach to us from this topic. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Let's lay our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands towards heaven. Let's ask God to move. Lord, we love you. 
We worship you and we praise you and we magnify you. God, and you are already here. God, your presence is already here. And we feel you. God, move in this place, God. Touch us by your spirit. God, move upon us, God. We love you. We worship you, God. Help us, God. Lord, God, to put a guard around our relationship with you. God, move upon us, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I'm going to talk to us just a little while about it doesn't take much. As I was commenting about uh, trying to learn how to pastor, one of the uh, greatest things that when I start this message out, I'm going to start by telling you the greatest mistake I ever made as a pastor. The greatest mistake I ever made as a pastor was deciding uh, that one Easter to try to get kids to come to be a part of our Easter service, I decided I was going to give away little baby chickadees to the kids that came to, uh, now I didn't ask the parents if they could have one. I didn't, I didn't ask if everybody else was, a, was glad that we got them. Uh, we just got some chickadees. And at the end of that Easter service, we started handing them out. And the one thing we forgot to do, Brother Whittington, was to tell was to tell those kids how tender and how fragile those little chickadees were. We had one kid over here in this corner. He was squeezing his till the eyeballs were popping out. We had one over here that was pulling its leg. We had one over here uh, that was trying to pull its feathers out. We had one that was trying to throw it and see how far he could throw it. And at the end of it, we had one big massacre of dead chickadees all over the backyard of the church because we didn't tell them that you had to handle those chickadees tenderly that you couldn't squeeze them you couldn't pull them you couldn't pluck their feathers you couldn't throw them they weren't baseballs and because they didn't know how tender those little chickadees were they all ended up dead and we ended up picking up chickadee carcasses all over the back of the church yard that's the worst mistake I ever made but as I thought about that brother Whittington tonight God has given me something that is even more precious and more tender than that chickadee and that is my relationship with God but if I'm not careful I'll forget that my relationship with God is very tender and very fragile and that it could be the smallest thing that could cause my relationship to either lose out with God or either go forward with God. So tonight, what God has sent me here to do is to challenge some young people, some saints of God, some young uh, students here to tell you that when it comes to your relationship with God, you better put a guard around it because it doesn't take much. For you to lose out with God. It doesn't take much for you to backslide. It doesn't take much for you to lose out with God. There is something that we have forgot about. That we have lost in all of the church things that we do. And we need to remember it. It is that we have an appointed assi or assignment appointed to us. And it is not death. The appointment of once died then the judgment doesn't worry me, Brother Whittington. But what does worry me is the Bible said that all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That what worries me is not the day I'm going to die, but what worries me is the day I stand before Jesus and I have to give an account for my life. And somehow we forgot that. But I want to remind everybody that sometime you're going to stand before Jesus and you're going to give an account for your life. And in that encounter, he is either going to say, depart from me, or he's going to say, well done, enter into the joy of the Lord. That means that that one appointment is going to determine my eternal destination. That one meeting with Jesus is going to determine, am I going to spend eternity in a paradise called heaven? Or am I going to be lost out, out of God's presence in a place called hell? And with so much on the line, with so much at stake... I've got to decide on this Wednesday night that the most important and valuable thing in my life is my relationship with God. And i got to make sure that the little things don't cause me to lose that relationship. i got too much, I got too much to lose to let some little thing 
destroy my relationship. God sent me here because I wanted to preach something else. But God sent me here to warn somebody that you're getting ready to make a decision. And it's just a small decision. It's just a small thing. There may be a young person here tonight that says my, my relationship with God can withstand a relationship outside of church. That, 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 I, that my relationship with God can withstand missing a few services. That my relationship with God can withstand missing prayer meeting. That my relationship with God can withstand not going to youth meeting. I've come to tell you it's those little things that will cause us to be lost out with God. And so tonight, I've come to tell somebody that you need to stand up and say, I'm going to take guard of my relationship with God because it is the most important thing I have. <laughs> Amen. When Isaiah describes the rebellion that went on in heaven, he said that there, Lucifer decided he was going to be like the Most High. And when he did, the Bible describes his, his eviction from heaven as simply God lifting his finger and casting out Satan and a third of his angels. And Isaiah, when he prophesied and told of this event, he said that two things were going to happen. He was going to be cast down to hell. And the second part of it is, was that everybody was going to get to see just how small and how little the devil really was. That there are some of you today, your testimony may be, the devil's been all over me. Well, when you see how little the devil is, you're going to be ashamed that you gave the devil so much credit. That when you look at him and when your eyes are open to how small he really is, you're going to leave here saying, I, I, there's no way that that devil can keep me from living for God. Isaiah said, Isaiah said, they're going to look on him. And people are going to ask the question, Brother Billy, they're going to ask the question, this is the one? This little dude sent me to hell. This little thing. You say, where do you get that? Well, listen to how Isaiah says it. He says, he says, they will look on him and narrowly look on him and they will say, is this the man? It's as if they're bewildered by the fact that the earth shook at the moving of this man, that the earth trembled and kingdom shook at this man. And it was simply Isaiah saying, it's the little small thing that's going to cause people to be lost and lose out with God. And tonight, I want to tell you tonight that it's time for us to stand up and say, I am not going to let the little thing, the little thing. Here's what the Lord asked. The Lord asked, and I'm almost done preaching. Uh, the Lord asked these two questions. He says, he says, what would you gain? What would you exchange for your soul? And if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, what have you accomplished? Because he understood the workings of the adversary. He understood that from the beginning, when Satan was cast down to earth, he always worked in subtle ways. Brother Billings, he always worked in subtle things. In fact, Genesis chapter 3 says this. It says he chose the serpent because it was the most subtle of creatures. That it didn't just roar like a lion and come out super fast at you, but it just snuck up on you. And see, and see here's why we have to protect our relationship with God. I, I need some help. Hey, would you help me, bud? Would you help me? One of y'all? Come on. Come on, you're taking up a time. Come on, come on, come on. There you go, man. Come on, come on, help me out. Because here, here is what, here's what the enemy will do to a child of God. What an enemy will do to a child of God is not get the child of God to backslide completely. All he does is just move him to the right just one inch. And move him to the right one inch. And to where it's unnoticeable except for when you get, because I read something that just blew my mind. The reason why people get lost in the desert is because when you don't have a focal point, it is impossible for a human being to walk straight. And so without you even knowing it, as you're trying to walk straight and you don't have a focal point to go on, you're walking just a little bit to the right until eventually you're two miles away from you where you intended to be. 
And that is how the enemy works. The enemy works. Because see, here's what somebody would say. Somebody would say, what does it matter? Anybody ever heard that? What does it matter? Brother Winston, we hear that all the time. What does it matter? It matters because when we see the devil moving you an inch, then eventually he'll keep moving you an inch until before long you're backslid, but you didn't make the decision overnight to backslide. It started by missing Sunday night. It started by missing a prayer meeting. It started by saying, I don't need to do that. I don't need to, I don't need to listen to everything Brother Whittington has to say. And what you do is eventually you're just letting the devil knock you. Knock you. Thank you for helping me, brother. Knock me. Go in one direction or another until eventually you've lost that with God. Thank you. And I want to tell you that's exactly what God is trying to warn us against. That somebody needs to say, I'm going to take a stand. And those little things that you hear the ministry from this church preach, you need to say, I'm going to do it. Because they may seem like small things, but they're going to be the exact things when the youth group listens to you, brother, when they hear you teach. And they may say, hey, it's just a small thing. It's just a small thing. I, I hear young people there at our church too. They're everywhere. They're saying, Brother, Brother Cannon, my, relation, my, my relationship with God can withstand a relationship outside the church. And I tell our young people, and I'll tell these young people, I know I'm not just preaching to young people, but I will tell you this, that flirting to convert does not work. It is a subtle ploy by the devil to lure you outside of the house of God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but you better listen to me. You better go home, get on Facebook, break up with that boyfriend, break up with that girlfriend. I didn't got the pastor, and I'm sorry. But, but I'm telling somebody, you need to realize that God sent me here on this Wednesday night to say you're about to make a small decision. And you've said, what does it matter? But it's the little bump that's going to lead you down the road, road to being backslid. And you better hear the words of Jesus when Jesus said, what shall you give in exchange for your soul? Or what if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? The writer of Song of Solomon said, watch out for the little foxes. Because they spoil the vine. When Jesus was prophesied of by Isaiah, when Isaiah said that Jesus came, the Bible said that he would grow up as a tender plant. That as powerful as Jesus was, he had to be handled with care. He had to be handled, even though he was God manifest in the flesh, he had to be handled with care. He went on to say, a bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall break forth judgment into truth. The little small things. All it takes is for you to decide that I'm going to, because you know where it starts? Here's where it starts. It starts with a three-word scripture that we sometimes overlook, and that's quench not the spirit. Because that's where it starts. Where it starts is when God shows up on a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and God starts speaking, brother. And what we do is ignore God's voice because we don't want to do what God said do. And when we quench the Spirit of God, that leads us down the road because we think, well, it doesn't make much difference because if I don't do it, somebody else will do it. But the point isn't whether or not it's going to get done. The point is God wanted you to do it. And there's some of you, the reason why you can't get any further in God is because God's already told you what to do and you refuse to do it. And you've quenched the spirit and that's led you down the road to where now, why can't I break through in prayer? Why can't I break through in miracles? Why can't I break through? It may be because you went that one step and said, I won't obey God. That is just a small thing. But can I tell you something? I'm not going to leave this on a negative note because can I tell you that the same is true of getting closer to God. That it doesn't take much for you to get away from God. But here's the good news. It doesn't take much for you to get back close to God. That, that really being successful in living for God is not major victories. It's a bunch of small victories. 
You, you know, I always thought, we had a preacher come to our church just a, just a few uh, weeks ago, and he was preaching about the manna. And in my mind's eye, Brother Billingsley, I always saw the manna as like rich crackers on the ground. But that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said it was like coriander seed. It was like, it was like the hoar frost. It was almost like they had to collect it with tweezers almost and put it in that jar. And, and God, and as that preacher was preaching, God just hit me with the fact that, you know what being blessed by God is? Just jarring up the small things. And eventually it became a blessing to them. And it was no wonder that they tried to get leftovers because it took so long for them to, to pick that little thing up little by little. And I want to tell you that that's what God also is saying tonight. Is he saying that yes, it is the small things that will get you away from God. But it is the small things that will get you back to God. That tonight your miracle could come. Simply by just lifting your hands, getting out of your pew, coming to this altar. You know, we live in an hour, and I know this is not true in this church, but a lot of churches where altar calls have become a thing of the past. You just get blessed in your seat. You don't get out of your pew. You don't get out of your, your chair. God will just bless you right where you're at. I'm going to tell you something. I have found that there's a blessing. I know I'm going to sound old-fashioned, that there's a blessing in getting out of your pew and getting around this altar because that might be that little thing I feel in the Holy Ghost, like here in a few minutes when I get done preaching, we're going to open these altars up. And there's going to be some of you, you've been sick in your body, you're in need of the Holy Ghost. And when we open these altars up, you're just going to make that little step. And the Holy Ghost is going to hit you, and God's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and God's going to heal your body. Amen. Amen. Because I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you with a testimony. Here, I've been, I've been leaving this testimony all over the place. Uh, if it's been a long time since some of you have seen me, uh, you can kind of tell that I'm getting around a little bit better than I was the last time some of you saw me. It was because God's healed me. Back in January of 2013, uh, or excuse me, when we were going into 2013, I was brought to the watch night service at our church in a wheelchair. I could not walk. Arthritis had eat up my knees, my feet, my ankles. I was walking with a limp if I could walk at all. I was, I, was, I was laid up in the bed, missed church for a month, and just laid in the bed, couldn't do anything, trying to get help, trying to get healed, trying to listen to all these doctors and tell me to do this and tell me to do that. And I was determined, Brother Billingsley, that God was going to heal me. I was determined that God was going to heal me. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have absolutely zero cartilage in your feet every time I put my foot to the ground it's bone on bone my whole foot I have zero cartilage in my feet arthritis had eaten it away and a little over 14 or 15 months ago I was in a wheelchair but I got in a service and I felt God say go down there and brother Billingsley I limped down to the altar at our church and I had my ministers lay hands on me. It wasn't anything big. It wasn't a conference. It wasn't a camp meeting. It was just a Thursday night service. And Brother Billingsley, I went to that altar. There was no Lee Stone King, no Wayne Huntley, no Anthony Mangle. None of them. Hey, if, if I could get, if I could have got to them, I'd have had them pray for me. But unfortunately, I don't have Anthony Mangan on speed dial. And so what I did was I said, okay, God, I'm going to listen to you. And I got out, and I'm the pastor of the church, but I get out in the altar, and Brother Billingsley, I just have my, my preachers lay hands on me. No Lee Stone Kings, just good men of God. And they lay hands on me, Brother, Brother, Brother Whittington, and all of a sudden, God tells me, God tells me, he says, Nathan, he says, I want you to leap for joy. And I'm going I'm to, uh, listen to me, I'm going to be honest. This is exactly what I said. God, you must be crazy. <laughs> it hurts to walk, and you want me to leap for joy? I'm just being honest. I know all of y'all are full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith all the time. Yeah. But, but when God said, when God told me to leap for joy, I was like, and... And, 
But you know what I determined? I remember the old story of Naaman. When Naaman said, if God had asked me to do some big thing, I'd have done it. But he, all he did was ask me to wash in the Jordan River. And so I said, okay, Lord. I said, I'm going to trust you. And you know what I started doing? And, and, and my leaping for joy wasn't more than just basically lifting my heels off the ground. You know, I, that, that's all I got. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that, that was all I had. I, I, I was getting my heels up off the ground. And it wasn't long until as they were praying and God, and God began to move on me and God began to touch me and I began to feel the Holy Ghost. And watch, it was that little act of just lifting my heels up. That now today I can be honest with you and tell you, I still have zero cartilage in my feet, but I can stand here 16 months later and without any pain. And I come to preach to somebody and tell you, that's the God that I serve. You come too far to tell me that God can't move, that God can't bless, that God can't heal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You listen to me. You listen to me. If you've got pain in your body, I've come to tell you that there's a healer in the house tonight. He is a healer. He healed me. I know what it feels like to have pain every night in your body. I know what it feels like to miss sleep because you got pain in your body. But I've come to tell you, the Holy Ghost sent me by to say, it might be a little thing that God might ask you to do in this service. But I've come to tell you, it doesn't take much to get a miracle. All you got to do is just be obedient. Hallelujah. 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 It was a little thing. 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 Brother, brother, imagine how foolish everybody must have thought I was if they didn't know my situation. And here I am going. And, and somebody that didn't know me, they would say, look at that lazy 38-year-old. Laziness can't even get off that they didn't know my story. And see, there's somebody here tonight. I may not be preaching to the whole congregation. I'm just preaching to some who need God to touch you tonight. And it could be that God said, I wasn't going to do it on a Sunday night miracle service. I wasn't going to do it on a revival service. I was going to wait till a Wednesday night where a little podunk preacher from Indiana would come and preach. And then that would be the point where I would touch you. That this could be the night of your miracle. This could be the night when you leave here saying, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Woo! Hallelujah. 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 I wonder if right now somebody just lift your hands and just begin to praise God. There's a Holy Ghost miracle presence in this place right now. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah, musicians, come on. Musicians, come on. God's getting ready to move. God's getting ready to move in this house. Oh, yes. <coughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish somebody just spend a moment in worship right now. I feel like God's doing a work right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Come on, that little act of faith, it doesn't take much. Come on, God's not needing some big thing. He just needs a small thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. It doesn't take much. Come on. People are already moving. People are already getting the message. Hallelujah. It doesn't take much. Oh, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Come on. Do you need a touch from God? Do you need a touch from God? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, do you need something from God? Do you need something from God in this place? Miracles in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost in Jesus' name.